so recording is on so i'm claire thompson for those who don't know me and i'm a digital education consultant at ulster university over in northern ireland so i'm kind of on the north end of the island and kate hi i'm kate malloy i'm a learning technologist at nui galway on the west coast of ireland but i'm working at home today in the dead center of the country in athlone Okay, so what we were going to be doing in London was some uh, Lego series play because I love that and it's always great because you get to do the most amazing um, workshops where you don't have to talk hardly at all. The participants do all the work and that's what I love and I have done Lego series play on line so I did it for the Alt Winter Conference but it just it didn't feel the same as um, it did given the situation of the pandemic. So I changed up and thought about it, just kind of little mini protest letters in this place where we are. So I put on there that the teachers must actively be committed to a process of self-actualization that promotes their own well-being if they're to teach in a manner that empowers students. And this was a discourse that was going around, obviously, for a long time. And after OER 19, I came away feeling really empowered by the care and the threads of care that we covered in that space, but feeling that it just didn't kind of sit right with the kind of discourses that we had. And then I found this blog by David Webster from 2017 that really captured that. And he tries to get underneath this kind of insistence that we've got to teach our students to be resilient and even ourselves as staff members and teachers we're being taught to be resilient and to be strong and learn how to um, fix ourselves, which is really such an individual approach and this morning's um, Twitter keynote from the SEMTOS 98 team really really captured the whole sentiment I think of that blog and they talked about uh, society where care replaces capital wealth at the core, at the very centre. And it's a really against this idea of individualism and coming together and the need to come together now. So that was where we were coming from. And then I just wanted to check with you and what kind of things that you have seen offered by institutions under this strange umbrella of well-being so is this something that you think is uk based um certainly i know that kate's experiences of the pedagogy lab last year they did have um pets didn't they kate over there they did um they had them a couple of times during the week um and it went over fantastically i think it actually just pulled people away from sessions because they didn't want to, to leave um, yeah, and it worked out well. We have the same thing on campus at NUIG as well. Um, we actually had um, ponies this start of the semester. Shetland pony appeared. So I'll put that one on. thinking of the library dogs at NUIG. Yeah. So are they there on a regular basis? I think they're regular enough. Um, Sharon might know exactly, but aren't they a few staff members dogs too that come in? Yeah, there, there definitely are. Um, um, I would know some of the staff members who bring their dogs in. It seems to be a, a regular occurrence. And I think the SU don't they do something as well that people can come in and walk the dogs? Yeah, I think so as well. And some of us just sneak our dogs in other times anyway. Yeah, cat on the mat. <laughs> our house is being dominated by the wanting of a rabbit recently, so <laughs> I might be there soon. So yeah, so the, these were the kind of things that I have been seeing kind of on Twitter and on um, local comms. So it's all very much to do with we're providing these wonderful, and they are wonderful, 
um, facilities for everybody to rest and relax and to calm. And it's like, but the thing is, what do we need to relax and calm from? And that's what moving now to um, how the initiatives have changed. So have you seen different kind of communications coming out in the last couple of weeks? So a lot of what I have seen is live and I feel does kind of almost to add to it. Like we've talked about the more Zooms, more Skypes, more ways of over communicating. So just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I've on our place and I just typed that way, way too far over. I've seen just some kind of social media Q&A sessions, kind of live Q&A sessions for students. But that unless I'm not seeing, um, you know, what's what's really happening or we're not getting those communications. That's the most of what I've seen. Uh, I think I've seen online sports, fitness. Um, opportunities kind of the student union or the sports center are trying to do what they can online mm. I know one thing our education officer has echoed a couple of times is that students are just bombarded with communication so maybe anything that is being offered might not be you know the message might not be getting through is there anything from the other institutions I see Louise came in there. Hi Louise, just saying hello. So yeah, so we've, we've just been cataloging sort of the strange and wonderful things that institutions have been rolling out over the last few years under this kind of umbrella term of um, well-being. So everything from ponies to dogs to yoga And then how that's going to change and how the narrative is going to change. Are you hearing anything from the institutions, Sharon, given that you're probably in touch with more folks from around the Irish universities? You know what, I'm 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 not really um I can see I can see a lot of anxiety. Um, online, particularly around um, accommodation and costs and and that sort of thing. And I, I saw that the NUI Galway president called for compassion um, when it came to, to student accommodation. But I'm not seeing a lot of initiatives. Um, and that I, what I'm seeing actually is individual academic staff showing a lot of care for their students. Interesting. And how, how is that kind of, how is that coming through? Slightly skipping ahead to Kate's slide perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose where, where I'm noticing it, I'm, I'm certainly not seeing an awful lot coming through from, from the IUA, which is the organisation that I work for, the Irish Universities Association. Um, we get a daily update of what's happening in the media and that sort of thing. But what I am seeing is a lot on Twitter of academic staff who are struggling with how they can provide that sort of um, care and compassion for their students. You know, there's a lot of staff who are worried about how their students are faring. There was one, for example, a, a tweet from Deirdre Burns yesterday talking about her, so she teaches German and she was talking about her students had done their oral exams for German, which I guess must have taken place online um, and just sort of congratulating them. So I, I can see that there's that concern from individual academics, but I'm not necessarily, certainly at the university level, there's just email after email after email, which is, is spooking me and I'm not even a student. Yes, I think that's coming out in some of our student groups that they are feeling overwhelmed and I think they're feeling that some things are maybe being repeated again and again. So where staff are trying to keep in touch and stay present, then that fine line of then over, over communicating. 
uh, one of the nicest ones that I've seen, I think it was on Twitter as well, and it was raised in our team meetings as an example, is that um, a teacher had sent her students all notebooks and pencils and said, just don't worry, just do what you can and just kind of reflect and write as you go through this. Don't worry about the schoolwork, don't worry about the timetables. So that was, to me, that's one of the nicest I've seen. And I just say that Jim commented there how Twitter became a really nice place once again. Um, and it and it is true. I think a lot of us have seen those messages of care, like Sharon mentions from academics or from sharing and helping each other. That all oh, suddenly it, it seems to be a less aggressive place. <laughs> I think, I mean, one of the things, I'm sorry, if you, do you guys mind if I talk or no? No, no, work away. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I think Stephen Downs, that that Canadian ed tech, right? Do we are we allowed to talk about Canadians in this session? <laughs> um, he wrote recently on his blog in response to something Clint Lalonde wrote yesterday, I think, basically writing saying that like, you know, rather than saying that the way we're doing pedagogy right now is just a stopgap measure and like it needs to be like this isn't real good online learning. The thing he said that I really like, I, I agree with and I connect with is, no, actually some of the, the sloppy, fast, cheap and out of control things that are happening now that like assertive or just resourceful ed techs and faculty are doing is probably pretty good practice in the, in the interstices. It's not gonna be perfect and that's always good. And as long as people are somewhat compassionate and caring, like, that's, I think this idea that we need more money and more infrastructure around like MOOC classes or video lectures is, is possibly one of the worst things that could happen as a result of this. And he argued that point and I don't disagree entirely. Like thinking like this is not real online learning until we can get our act together might be a mistake. I don't know, does every, anyone, am I completely wrong there? Probably, but I figured it's worth thinking about. No, I think I'm with you. We, we've been advocating a lot in our support work that low tech can be just as good as high tech. And I know, Francis, that's one of the things that from the quilt um, reveal yesterday that really to celebrate imperfection, we've got to just stop with the perfection. Yeah, and I think that just even the money, like as money is going to be increasingly an, an issue and financially, right, for everybody, the idea that we're going to need to spend, you know, the traditional idea was two to three hundred thousand dollars on a well produced produced MOOC course, at least in the U.S., was insane. Like that's money's just not going to be available, and if it is, it should be for people, not for production. And so I think hopefully there'll be a shift, right, in kind of the the prevention to fetishize perfect content and an investment in kind of connections, relations, people, and a larger idea. So I wonder if that will happen. I don't know. Well, I, I definitely would like to see the people focus and not the production focus. Definitely. Yeah. And we've been trying to push that low tech aspect as well. It's not in going over well with everyone. So we're still trying to support folks, trying to do slightly more complicated or high tech or synchronous stuff. And that just conversation is completely ongoing. So I'm kind of I'm half kind of half in agreement there with, you know, this isn't normal because it's not normal. Like it, it's never the way things were meant to be intended. But at the same time, you know, we're trying to push the people first. And the fact that it's sloppy, like Jim, you're saying, and people will make mistakes. I produced kind of a getting started with online learning lesson for our students just to kind of walk them through the basics. But one of the things we really put in there was just be patient with each other because this is new for everyone. Yes, Wendy. Yeah. <clears throat> and I do say, I have to say that pivot is not my favorite word at the minute. <laughs> I don't know about all you. <clears throat> um, can I come in there, if that's okay? It's yeah, yeah, welcome. Hey, um, nice to see you all. Um, this is a cozy group. Um, 
One of the things I've been doing with my staff is that we've been running online daily uh, kind of drop in webinars for staff and we've had overwhelming support for doing that um, and people have been really interested in having kind of a sort of a casual space to, to sort of drop in and talk about things. But one of the things I'm finding is this constant conversation seems, seems to always get channeled into the which technology route and which technology is the institution supporting and can we use other ones and what are the problems with other ones and there's always this um uh, what we're trying to do i suppose and we're, we have the luxury of having an extended conversation over a couple of weeks now is trying to move people beyond that idea there's a silver bullet to solve the problem that we're having now, you know, that solutionist kind of approach towards technology. So um, I don't know if anybody else has kind of had a similar thing, but it's a very slow moving conversation about, um, about moving beyond the idea of, of finding the right thing to do something quickly now, um, but also just generally people's attitudes towards technology and why can't it just fix everything, you know? Um, I don't know, just throw that out there. Anybody else want to pick that up? I, I love that idea, frankly, uh, Luis. And I think one of the things that's cool there is that uh, there is a sense that why can't a technology just help or fix it when I think the bigger issue there is why aren't we, why aren't we actually training people in this notion of literacy, both faculty, students? And I don't mean we like, why aren't you doing it, right? Like there's been a decade or two now where we could have embraced the idea of understanding how, you know, architectures online, file structures, naming conventions, how links work, how relative learning works, how owning your own space might be useful, like how all these things that could have potentially been useful are now just like, I see faculty and teachers just here with my students or with my, my, my kid, <laughs> my children, and the, them having to negotiate with their teachers and the teachers don't understand things like file formats and the way in which they'll work on some platforms versus others. Like I'm not talking like coding, like I'm talking about some really basic literacies around the technologies. And I think that's starting to really bear its head and where our responsibility as educational institutions, and these are teachers I'm talking about, these are educators, these are students, is a really larger question and I think Having let the technology drive those discussions for so long, the turnkey LMS solution has put us like, someone called it like, we're really starting to see our technical debt right now. It's showing and we need to really start emerging from that. So I, I think maybe that's a, a possibility too. Wendy, do you wanna come in? Are you able to talk? I was just thinking of what Louise said, and um, I agree that you can waste a lot of time, you know, talking about Zoom and Skype and Collaborate and the never-ending uh, list of things. So I guess, in a way, for me, it's I look at the LMS and I go, okay, this is what you've got. Now let's just move on to how you're going to connect with your students. So in some ways, it's simplifying the process. Uh, in our case, where we're paying a swag of money to a company to provide an LMS. And so now we can just try and transition people fairly quickly into what, how they need to connect with students, how they need to assess, how they need to get the information across. Yes, and I think that's something that I would relate to as well and feeling what Jim was saying to that if we could just get everyone to have a lovely clear folder structure with beautifully named documents that would just be my biggest win of the decade I think and that's something that file formats I've seen coming through with even my children and teachers and it's like yes they know how to use their iPad yes they can get onto cool game sites but they don't understand file structure. They don't even understand what a browser is and what the different browsers offer and how to fix problems, definitely. Yeah, I think uh, one of the complications I've seen is, is uh, the trainer, in this case, further education or vet, 
has a good idea to you know take a video on an iPad but there's no understanding of how to get that point from there to anywhere else to for the students to see and to have it in the LMS and to the streaming system and all that sort of thing so um, my mind's just going madly trying to think of all the training that I'd have to give this person or otherwise I have to do it myself and I think that's why a lot of people in ed tech and learning design are just exhausted at the moment <laughs> it's uh, there's just so much extra thinking to do yeah and I think that's really where we're coming from from this um, lovely chat with everybody and kind of trying to build up these letters and it's kind of thinking about ourselves as much as our students and I know Kate um, she can talk us through a little bit because she wrote this this time last well almost a year ago where you must have been in a very <laughs> different headspace Kate. Yeah and even just to quickly build on what Jim and Wendy were talking about there we just I just came out of a Celt staff meeting and one thing that was coming up for us was just the word variables is how to upskill people <laughs> in this time when you're dealing with so many different platforms and different tools and it comes back to the work we're doing even with the enhancing digital teaching and learning project it's really around competencies and we didn't think we'd be doing it in an emergency because this was yeah this was from July last year um, I was a fellow at Digi Digital Pedagogy Lab and I was in Kevin Gannon's track on inclusive teaching. So we were looking at inclusive design practices and Kevin, actually, I think he's just recently released his book, Radical Hope, if we give him a, a shout out, but um, he had written a teaching manifesto of his own called Radical Hope. And he had challenged each of us in the class or in the track to write our own inclusive online teaching manifesto. And if you've been at DPL or if you're familiar with it, I'll just pop a link to the, the blog post in the, the chat there. But um, it, it's, it's quite a daunting <laughs> week um, of really teasing out some complex issues. And we are allowed to do it, obviously, in any kind of format. We would have wanted some, pe some people put together some really interesting kind of digital stories, um, did some really artistic and creative things. And I wrote a series of statements and I wasn't entirely sure how to convey the message behind it. Um, oh, sorry to see you go, Louise. That's OK. We'll chat soon. Um, and I, I ended up defaulting to my 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 always my fallback was a bunch of Simpsons gifts to illustrate what each of my um, my points was. But anyway, that the points for the kind of the main aspect of the manifesto was to keep it quite short and sweet. but um. One thing after being at DPL for two years and kind of being in those circles in my own learning design workshops, I was always using Sean Michael Morris's quote of peek through the screen in terms of online learning is that how are we reaching students through the screen? So from my point of view, I was looking at our kindness and empathy. If you're trying to be inclusive in your practice, visible through the screen, and is it even possible to do that in my own teaching? I would always default to words and to the message through the screen because I'm a former high school English teacher and that's, I suppose, what I would fall back on. But just given the time that we're in, we're in a very different space than when I wrote <laughs> wrote this in a hopeful week in you know, July in Virginia um, when we none of this was, was on our radar. So I was just wondering if anyone has any thoughts or ways that they think we could achieve this, especially in this time? It's an awesome post. I mean, just gifts alone. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I do think like the whole idea of the fun, the gift that focuses on like, how is what we're doing, you know, embracing the medium? Like that to me has always been the, you know, $100,000 question is, are you doing something using the online frame that is actually understanding the medium? And I think like you said, Kate, it goes back to a sense of literacy, like a literacy that's, I think there's a lot of professors I work with at UMW who were awesome teachers, um, but there was a transition between understanding how the classroom relationship would work versus an online one. And that transition is something I think 
I always thought the ed tech was like a replicant, right? Like we had a five or six year lifespan at best. There would be a time when we'd get everybody trained up to understand the digital literacies around the web and those faculty would really transition smoothly and have that sense. And then we would die, right? Like hopefully not literally, but the whole, like the whole, <laughs> the whole like community would, like it would no longer be necessary. But it's been a very long drawn out process. And I think a lot of that is because the third, uh, third party vendor technology has kind of made those conversations that you're posing in that post a lot harder and seemingly unnecessary. And so I appreciate that post because it gets at the heart of what we need to do. Thank you. I, I, I was worried in that space that especially at DPL that it would not be taken seriously with with the gifts, but the, the, the statements, you know, just in trying to illustrate them, it actually was totally about that. It was about the joy and about the playfulness. And I, I agree that I think we're trying to meander with different tools and even some of our very basic worker and literacies now has actually stepped back and said, you know what, maybe you don't need to use all the stuff we spend a lot of money on. Maybe you can just record a quick screencast or a video using QuickTime if you have a Mac. Just do it yourself and get it up somewhere rather than worrying about what Wendy's talking about in the chat there, the polished aspect. You know, does it, are you human and are you vulnerable through the screen when things are a bit too slick rather than just being, being ourselves? I don't know if anyone else wants to come in. Yeah, no, I had a conversation just yesterday with an academic where they were worrying about um, emojis and kind of how professional emojis were. And I said, well, they're human, they're international. So she was specifically talking about uh, a session that had been with international students. So they were using their emojis to um, determine their mood in the chat. So people were baking bread or what, what not. But yeah, it's still that literacy thing underlying it's like oh are we allowed can we be human is that a negative is that a feel does anyone else want to come in on that i know it's a very loaded type of question because as wendy's saying there it is it is tricky to get that empathy piece right um especially in those tools. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy, come in. Uh, no, I was just thinking of the emojis and how that uh, since my team has moved to MS Teams and we're all uh, split into our various corners and we've picked up things like customising your own memes and, you know, using GIFs so much more. And it's really changed. Uh, like I've worked in this team for... Uh, six, seven years, and with different people in that time, but a core that are the same. And I find the communication is, is changing with with this sort of flexibility of of uh, using memes for a bit of sarcasm, using gifs for a bit more emotion, and uh, perhaps exaggerated emotion just to to reach out uh, because we're feeling a little bit more isolated. And that's what do you think then as ed tech people, we can transition easier to emojis? Do you think that teaching staff as a wider pool? Think oh, that I think totally. Um, as ed tech, we don't have really any hang ups about what's professional, what's not professional. <laughs> um, and I know that supporting a, a wide range of academics, uh, I would be hesitant in sending a GIF unless I've known them for quite a while. Uh, and it's it's definitely something that uh, I can use in with peers, but I don't see it so much in, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to get some academics just to get onto the chat programs. They're not used to chatting. They're used to writing announcements, writing, yes discussion board posts, writing feedback for students. Uh, it's not really, they're not even used to that kind of casual. 
Yes, and I think a lot of those announcements are growing in length. I kind of touched on that at the beginning of the talk, but from what I've seen, that those announcements are getting longer and longer in this distance world we're in. I wonder if I could... And more complex with changing rules. Sorry, Sharon. No, no, that's okay. Um, I was just going to mention that the emojis reminded me um, one of the things that we've been doing as part of the project over the last two weeks is trying to um, put together really short videos um, of staff and students who are struggling with teaching and learning online. And the emojis reminded me of one from last week, actually from um, Neil Madden at NUI Galway, where he spoke about, um, he, he teaches maths, so he's been using Collaborate and he switched to it two weeks ago. Um, and he, he spoke about how in the first couple of times he felt like he was speaking into the void and, and that um, I suppose that the, the technology is a barrier for people who aren't used to teaching online and it's very difficult to get the, the human side into it. But then he said that he started encouraging his students to use emojis um, during the, in the, the, the chat function on Collaborate. Um, I just thought it was it was really nice. He he just felt that he was no longer speaking into the void that there were, that there were people at the other end and, and they were showing their appreciation or confusion or whatever it might be. And I just thought I just thought it was a nice example. I'm gonna post the um the link to the video in there in case anybody'd like to look at it. It's it's about just under two and a half minutes, so it's really short. Um but I I think you know it's it's really interesting, Jim, talking about the the literacies and and I think you know, Kate's question there, are kindness and empathy visible through the screen? They are, but it's, it is only possible, I think, when people are more comfortable um, with the, the use of the technology and, and if they've been forced into it, as they have been over the last couple of weeks. A lot of staff are wondering what's allowed or what's not allowed. Um, and that talk as well about the um, the, the focus on the tools and the technologies. Um, what I'm noticing, and this is because I'm working across seven different universities, and the seven different universities have got five different VLEs. When we talk about the transition to teaching online in the last few weeks, we have, we have a good language that we can use to share experiences and discussions around it but when we start talking about assessment suddenly it all comes down to the tools and what tools people are using and i find that quite interesting and it's something that i want to try and explore a little bit more um i think i think it might be something to do with that comfort and that wondering what's allowed or not allowed um that people are a lot more cautious when it comes to the assessment piece because they've had the exams office putting in place policies and procedures and you know you must do this and you can't do that much more so than teaching so um so i think that it's that's very much coming out a lot more these days that people are concerned about what they can or can't do with the tools i don't know if that makes any sense anyway that's just me throwing stuff out there i love that idea sharon frankly and i think one of the things that I put a link in too, inspired by your link for that emoji one is, we did a workshop at UMW, University of Mary Washington, actually with a digital pedagogy lab where <laughs> you went um, to yeah. enjoy that. Uh, but there was actually, we did a gift workshop and we showed students and faculty who were working on Chinese cinema, how to take this medium, which a lot of people thought was a throwaway and say, well, actually let's think about it in the context of the class. And almost like offered a segue to just create stupid gifts and then also think about how gifts have become a kind of almost like emojis, right? Have become part of our syntax online and how we communicate, right? We communicate as effectively with an image moving as we do with uh, with anything we can't do physically on the screen, right? It almost prevents us needing to do all of these video chats. Like emojis and gifts can be thought of and memes can be thought of shortcuts and a, another kind of literacy and another kind of syntax and grammar for the online. So I love that and I would love to explore that. So Sharon, that's just a, a way of saying that's awesome.
So I think that, take, that takes us back to Kate, your experience of feeling that even in the pedagogy lab, that your gifts were maybe going to be something that wouldn't be well taken. Yeah, it's it, it's because you have such a varied kind of space there that you have folks coming from, they're either academics or K to 12 or in support roles like learning technologists, you have folks coming from all over the world, variety of institutional contexts. And it does tend to be quite a heavy, a heavy week. Um, and people are really doing some deep diving. But what I suppose I was doing in kind of creating short statements was that I, I didn't want to write this, you know, massive long screed because I, I know I've been I was a teacher for many years. I, you know, I'm fairly clear cut in what my pedagogy is. But yes, then <laughs> incorporating the gifts. You know, and, and it's funny, maybe in Jim's time that would have been that would have gone down a lot better. <laughs> but um in in that space, um it actually went over better than I expected. Um and it was just as I scroll down the page, the first one there is choosing your pedagogy and it's Mr. Burns looking at ketchup or cats up trying to make the decision in the grocery in the grocery store. Um and I think it was just kind of an oddly needed laugh because there's an awful lot of emotion. Um, and it wasn't to take it as tongue in cheek. I love The Simpsons and I think illustrating very simple thoughts in some sort of joyful or playful way, it's, it's getting back to the heart of what we do as technologists and even as, as teachers, is that what is, you know, what is the joy? What is the playfulness? Because it is messy and it is, you know, it, it is what it is. So I think just bringing that humor into it actually did go down quite a treat so I was pleased with that because I was I was definitely afraid I, I definitely uh, did not get up to share mine for a very long time <laughs> um, when, uh, when hands were flying up to get up and share their work I uh, got up there quick and ran away again but no I, I think yeah definitely it was just and it was part of me you know that's my personality that's you know it's something I default to and, and Claire I know we had those conversations after you were presenting your work at the press ed conference through parks and recreation gifts and that's where we, we kind of came back to gifts again and hats off to you because that was masterful but that's exactly i think back to where we were about the care here because that um the night before i hadn't written a thing that was when i really hit my wall after so many live webinars just the being in the house the everything coming to head and the last thing I was thinking was, I cannot write this presentation. It's in the morning. I just can't. And then I was going to go with Father Ted, but I wasn't sure how global Father Ted would be. And when I checked, there weren't actually that many gifts. And then for some reason, just parks popped into my head. And just spending an hour, an hour and a half um, creating those tweets and finding the right gift for the right tweet was just, it did exactly what the care was to do. Like. I came back from the wall, I had a presentation, I was able to go to sleep because I had something. So for me, it was that was very big self care. And it's, it's funny too, because I wonder also, like, you can get a really awesome visual analogy out of a GIF. I mean, almost just even as a pedagogical strategy, to think like, you know, I'm going to make a point like the cat's up, and then talk yeah. about a decision or like a well-placed GIF as a way to link an idea to a visual, maybe nomad. I don't know how, if like, what would you call like a memory device or a way to help people mm. remember it or understand it? Like if you look at GIFs on Wikipedia and there's a way to search for them, there is like hundreds of thousands of GIFs explaining super complex scientific models, which I think <laughs> is crazy. So it's like, like gifts as a as a pedagogical strategy for me would be like the great revolution <laughs> and it starts exactly we were on the ground floor and i uh, just looking at the chat there agreed wendy i think humor and poetry um that will have to sustain us through this crisis because after this chat. <laughs> so it's five past one here. I'm not sure. So Wendy, what time is it with you? Bedtime? Yeah. 
so it's getting late for Wendy and I think we're all coming. This has been absolutely wonderful. The letters element is the asynchronous part of the um, of the session. So what I'll do is I will put the link back in because I know that some of you have got some fab letters in there and it was just another way of self-care and to have a rant and to do something a bit creative for five minutes so I would really encourage everybody to go and add one if they haven't added one or to listen um Wendy's done an absolutely beautiful SoundCloud reading of hers so thank you so much and if anybody would like to read one now or add one to the screen then let us know but otherwise it's been a really really nice session and it's definitely helped me through this week thank you you guys rule thank you thank you so much folks that uh, i'm just going to go off and compose a lot of different tweets of gifts now to express <laughs> myself um but i was another just to end on i i was a bit stuck when we came up with the idea to to write letters so i actually did some meta remixing with um brian mathers uh visual thinkery remixer machine. So there's some of his images remixed with Simpsons memes in there, um, outlining my my letter to uh, COVID-19. So I, I'm not quite, not quite as profound as Wendy's. Uh, mine's in there as well. That's what, and it really did for me speak to the fact that it's openness and this is an OER conference and it was exactly what was required even though you didn't think it at all. I always undersell myself with these sort of things. <laughs> yes, no, you it were was actually, it was, no, it was just great with Brian's, um, with his Polaroid, the storyline, because it does tell a story. So the format, once I figured out the format, I could put my message, um, put my message in. And that's what I think going back to we would have been doing Lego had we been in London. And that's something that it offers that is difficult through other mediums is that you dump that big box of Lego on the table and it's solid and it's there and people just put their hands out and stick it together in any shape or form. And that block of I'm not creative is removed. So this is where an asynchronous one, I think, just showing how many different ways there is is brilliant. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you. It really was a lovely conversation. So I'm going to press stop record.